You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org. Hey guys, keep standing, if you will, for me uh, for just a second. Hello, welcome to Maker's Church. Happy Sunday. If we've never met, my name is Shalise, and I am one of the pastors here. Um, And before you sit down, I just wanted to recap with you, uh, if if you're joining us for the first time, we're in week two of an incredible five-week series called Do This and You Will Live. And I know you're thinking like, ooh, do what? What is, what is the thing to do? Uh, if you heard Pastor Mark's incredible talk last week, he said like, get to see Chapa, like come with me if you want to live. And I was like, oh, I'm not good at the Arnold impersonation. Um, but we are talking about what it means to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. This incredible verse that we're gonna actually read it together uh, before we take a seat. So Matthew 22 37 to 39. If you guys would read this with me, it says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Today, I get to talk to you guys about what it means to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So if you do me a favor, turn to your neighbor next to you. You can ask him, like, won't you be my neighbor? Um, And just say, hey, you got a really big heart. I can tell from over here, you got a really, really, really big heart. Give him a hug. Give him a high five. (laughs) However you would like to say hi to your new neighbor. We got lots of new neighbors here, lots of new neighbors. All right, give that last person a hug or a high five. Feel free to take your seat. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I got a pretty big heart. And what I really... um, I'm intrigued about by this idea of what it means to love the Lord your God with all of your heart is that the way that you love God with all of your heart is going to look very different than the way that I love God with all of my heart. I think we can all agree our hearts, our souls, our mind, and our strength. Your mind is not my mind and your soul is not my soul. And the way that God has uniquely strengthened you and gifted you is not the way that he has uniquely strengthened and gifted me. But I think there are some things um, that we can all agree on when it comes to how do we love God with all of our hearts. So uh, my husband and I just moved to a new house and we did the super hipster thing and we got rid of cable. It's like, you, it, you almost feel bad saying that you have cable. You're like, I have cable and DVR. And I would always say like, commercials are for peasants, you know. Um, I... <laughs> But most of it I don't miss. Okay, that's a lie. I miss all of it. I'm like, Master Chef Junior, where are you? Um, but one of my absolute favorite shows that I would DVR every single episode, it didn't matter if it was repeat, was a show called Impractical Jokers. And yes, if you've watched it, you know, and if you don't, now you do. You're welcome. This is what you learned today. Like you can go and just live a fuller, more productive life. Um, but Impractical Jokers is this incredible show and it's these four friends from high school And they do like these different challenges and impractical jokes across the city of New York and beyond. And they have this one uh, bit that they do. And they go into a supermarket. And the challenge is that you have to go up to a stranger and you have to tell them a secret. And then you have to get them to tell you a secret back. Which I'm like, this is a very dangerous game, right? And a lot of people are like, okay, crazy person, please don't talk to me. But I was watching this one episode and uh, one of the guys goes up to this girl and he's like, hey, you know, and he tells her this secret and he's like, secret for a secret? And she looks at him, she's like, I hate my boyfriend's girlfriend. (laughs) 
Or no, I hate my, si- my brother's girlfriend, my boyfriend's girlfriend. <laughs> I hate myself. No. He said, I hate my brother's girlfriend. <laughs> that would have been way funnier. But she said, I hate my brother's girlfriend. I was like, oh no, you just said that on TV. She is going to see that. Like you are in such trouble. That is so awkward. Like, yeah, I hate her. Um, so I wanted to keep the awkwardness going. So I turned to my husband and I'm like, what's your secret? Like what would, you know, if somebody came up to you, like what would you say? And I think he said something like, I love my wife so much it hurts, you know? And I was like, lame, (laughs) whatever. But I was trying to think about it. I was like, what would my secret be? Like, I, when I was younger, I don't know if you guys did this, but like we were always sharing secrets, but we would come up with crazy things to make sure that somebody was trustworthy. I didn't just share my secrets with somebody in the grocery store. I was like, hey, you got a pinky promise first. Like, you're not going to tell anybody, right? Or it was like blood brothers, you know, like, let's just cut ourselves, merge our blood, and then we'll always keep each other's secrets. You know, or the thing, uh, finish this if you know it. Cross my heart and, yeah, no. <laughs> I don't want to, like, stick a needle in my eye. Like, that is very aggressive. Um, and I'm not a big fan of, of, of those things because I'm like a need to know person. When they say like it's on a need to know basis, I'm like, yeah, I need to know everything. Like I want to know all of your secrets, but the problem is I am horrible at keeping secrets. You do not want to tell me your secrets. Um, when people say to me like, hey, don't tell anyone, my first response is like, okay, when you say anyone, Like, just nobody that knows you? Like, can I call my friend Kendall in Sacramento who doesn't know who you are? Because I need to process this out loud with somebody. Like, it is going to eat me alive. Or I'll do this thing where I kind of like hint that I might know something, but I don't straight out say it. So I'm like, hey, you know what would be, like, what would be really cool is if people started dating? You know, I just love when people start dating. And like if they met, you know, like at our church, like serving on our team, say the tech team, whatever, you know, I don't know. But like, wouldn't that be crazy? (laughs) Wink, wink. Like, do you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) I love hinting at things in in hopes that somebody will know what I'm talking about. But you know what I hate the most? Sorry, tech team, I love you. (laughs) Hey, I didn't say names, but come find me afterwards because I can't keep a secret and I'll tell you if you want to know. What I hate is somebody who starts telling you something and then they stop. They're like, oh, hey, did you hear? Actually, I can't say anything. I'm like, are you kidding me? No, we're not leaving this place right here until you tell me. Like, you're not going to tell me, but you, you told me there's something. When somebody's like, hey, can we talk? What about next Thursday? I'm like, what are you doing right now? Because I'm already driving to your house. We're going to talk this out. This is why I don't start shows until the whole season's over. Because I don't want to get to episode three and be like, what's going to happen? No, I want to know. Does he stay? Does he go? Does she pick him? Does he die? Like, I have to know what is happening. I don't like this, like, in the middle space of the unknown. So there's a story in scripture that frustrates me to no end. And and we're going to read it together. And it's in Mark 8. Mark 8, 22 to 25. It says, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes, gross, and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. This is the only two-part miracle in all of scripture. This is the only time that Jesus goes to heal somebody. He sees some trees walking around like people, and then he puts his hands on his eyes to heal him again. If this is a TV episode, it's like the first time Jesus puts his hands on his eyes and then he opens up and things are blurry and then the episode cuts. And you're like, what? 
tune in next week. Like, and then I'm illegally looking on every Chinese website. Like, how do I find out episode two? Like, have you been released in like Lithuania yet? I will go there, you know, spam, don't care. Crash my computer. I got to know what's happening. You know, but as interesting as this two-part miracle is, what in the world does it have to do with loving God with all of your heart? Well, it's a secret, and I'm not telling you. I'm just kidding. I'm going to tell you later. Uh, But before I tell you, there are two things about this miracle that I find fascinating. Two things that really confused me at first, um, but then when I kind of unpacked it a little bit more, I realized that there was something really profoundly beautiful happening in this story. The first thing about this miracle that confused me was it's private. It's a private miracle. It says, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. I don't understand why Jesus takes him outside the village. See, Jesus had a reputation in Bethsaida. This was not the first time he had been there. Recently, Jesus had performed a miracle. Some of you might have heard of it. He fed over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. So he comes to this town, and there's this young man who his friends bring him to Jesus and are begging Jesus to heal him. But I wonder how many other people were also there. How many other people also knew that Jesus was in town and were trying to come and see him? I picture like the streets are just packed with people, like San Diego at Comic-Con, you know, and you're like, oh, I can kind of maybe see the guy from Stranger Things. I'm not sure if it's him. You know, and they're like, is that Jesus? Like way over there, like there's probably just so many people. And here's this one guy, like what are the odds? And if I'm this one guy, I'm not feeling too good about my chances. I mean, I absolutely hate crowds. Like, I don't know if anybody else shares my disgust for having to like drive around to look for parking. Uh, My husband and I went to get coffee yesterday. Our decision was completely based off of where we could find parking. It wasn't like, oh, let's go to the beach. Let's go somewhere romantic. It was like, where can I get the closest to the coffee shop without having to walk in the sun And, you know, everything was just about how close we could get to avoid parking. It's why I don't go to the beach on the weekends, ever. I'm like, I live here. I'll go, like, Tuesday morning at 10. You know, I'm not going to go on a Saturday, right? It's why I don't go to Disneyland, ever. I know. I know that this is the part in the talk where I either lose you or I get you. But, like, (laughs) I... I have to have you understand how much I hate being crowded. My husband and my best friend love Disney. My best friend Chelsea is obsessed with Disney. She named her dog Walter after Walt Disney, right? I love Chelsea so much, I would give a kidney for her. We have been best friends for 10 years. Ask me how many times I've been to Disneyland with her. None. Zero. And I'm not going to do it because I absolutely hate crowds. But this is why you need lots of friends, right? You need good friends that don't look at the crowd and go like, maybe, maybe we'll catch him on the next tour. You know, I think he's coming back. You need friends who are like, hey, it doesn't matter how many other people are here. We are going to take you to meet Jesus. So thank goodness this guy has a lot of good friends. They take him to Jesus, they beg him to heal him, they make it, and then it says that he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And I just don't get it. He might have had hundreds, if not thousands of people there to see him. This would have been an amazing moment to heal this guy in front of everybody And yet he takes him outside of the village. And I couldn't shake it. I was like, God, why? Why would you take him outside where nobody's going to know what happened? The crazy part is at the end of the story, he says, don't go tell anybody. Like not only does he heal him in private, but he says, don't even tell anybody what happened. And I was thinking, I was racking my brain. I was like, why would you do that? Why, God, would you take this guy outside to perform this miracle when you could have done it in front of everybody? 
And the conclusion that I came to is I think that in this moment, Jesus wanted to show this young man that performing this miracle was not about proving who God was. It was about proving to this young man that he was worthy of being healed. Even if Jesus wasn't getting the credit and the glory and everybody witnessing this miracle, I think he just wanted to show this young man that this isn't about me, this is about you. This is about your healing. This is about you getting what you need. And I wonder how many times God does that for us. He moves heaven and earth to connect with us, to meet with us, not to bring glory to his name, but because he loves us, because we're worth it to him. So he does it in private. The second thing that I don't quite understand is why it's a process. Again, this is the only two-part miracle in all of scripture. Mark 8, 23 says, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? See, the verb here, asked, it's actually an imperfect tense. And what it is, is that, that word being in the imperfect tense suggests that it is not finished, it is still happening. So when he asks him, it indicates that Jesus knew that this was not the end. Jesus knew that this was a process. And so he asks him, do you see anything? I was like, what, why would God do that? Why would he start something and not finish it? Why would he half heal the guy, right? He has a reputation. He has been here before. People know that he can do miracles with a snap of his finger, with just a word. You know, he knows that like this is the God of healing. And so when God takes him outside of the village, spits in his eyes and puts his hands on him, you know, and the guy opens his eyes and Jesus says, what can you see? I imagine at the very least, he's like a rainbow or a unicorn or like a double rainbow at least, like something. He's imagining like and expecting to see everything and to see miracles. But he looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. I see people. They look like trees walking around. Maybe he did see people and maybe they looked like trees or maybe he was outside of the village and he saw trees and they looked like people walking around. But like either way, if I'm this guy, I'm super disappointed. I mean, Jesus, not your best work, right? Like half a healing, you could have done the whole thing. I've watched Harry Potter. I know what happens when you only do half a spell. Like it is not good. You gotta finish those things, right? And so he gets like his half of a healing and he's expecting this life-changing miracle. And I wonder how often we experience the promises of God in that very same way. You know, we expect everything and we just get something. We expect wholeness and healing and instead he just begins a process with us. So my secret, right? How do you love God with all of your heart. I think for me, learning to love God in the process is how I love him with my whole heart, with all of my heart. See, not just in the good times, not just when everything is clear, not when everything makes sense, not when it's all finished and I can look back and see how God was moving, but in those moments when I feel utterly forgotten, like, did, did you forget the rest of it? Like you brought me this far, but like, I still have a long way to go. Are those moments when you kind of start to kind of get a picture and you have this vision and this idea of maybe what your life will look like or your job will look like or your relationships will look like or parenting will look like and then nothing is kind of working out and the trees look like people and the people look like trees. Like learning to love God in those moments is how I love God with all of my heart. And it's not easy because my natural reaction when my expectations aren't met is to like take my blurry vision and go home. Like, thanks for the trees, God. Like, at least I guess I can see something. 
but not this guy. See, this guy understood that like loving God with all of your heart is clinging to the promises of God no matter what you can see or cannot see. Loving God with all of your heart. What do we do? You know, when our vision is blurry and we can't see the promises clearly. And I think we have to be more like this blind man. We have to step into incredible trust and faith and we have to let him do it again. Right, Mark 8, 25, it says, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open, his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. See, this blind man didn't know there was a second healing coming. He could have been super frustrated and left. He could have been really discouraged, but instead it says that he stays and once more he lets Jesus put his hands on him and continue the work that he had started. And I wonder how often God starts something in our lives, but because of our impatience, because of our lack of faith, because of our lack of trust, we don't have the patience to sit in the process. We expected something to happen immediately. And when it doesn't happen on our timeline or the way we wanted it or with our expectations surrounding it, instead of stepping back in and saying, God, I know that you will always finish what you started, that you will always be true to your promises. Instead of that, we just leave and we don't give him a chance. See, I think that God has things for each of us, right? He's doing something in each of our lives, but we have to be willing to accept that most of the time it's a process. Right? And no matter what's happening in your circumstances or your situations, as you're sitting here and you're thinking about that thing that hasn't happened in the way you wanted it to happen, or isn't coming quick enough, or you got the thing you wanted and it just wasn't what you expected, would we have the courage to just stay and to stand in that space and say, God, let's do it again? It doesn't matter if I failed. It doesn't matter if it didn't work out. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what my expectations were. Like when we get before the living God, we have this opportunity to ask him for the things that we need. We have this opportunity, Psalm 37, four, one of my favorite verses about the heart. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And most of us, when we come to God, we see that verse in a very selfish way. God, if I just love you with all of my heart, you'll give me everything my heart wants. And I remember from a very young age, realizing that that's not what that verse meant. He says, hey, if you love me with all your heart, I'm actually going to give your heart desires. I'm gonna show you the things that you should long for, the things that you should want. I'm gonna give you expectations. I'm gonna give you promises. And those are the things that you'll always be able to bank on because he never starts something and doesn't finish it, ever. So if you close your eyes with me, I'm gonna just lead us through a time of prayer because there's so many hearts in this space represented and I wish that we could go around and just have every single one of you share what God was doing in your lives what God was doing in your hearts but I think that this is what was so beautiful about this miracle is it was private even though maybe your friend brought you to church like Jesus wants to take you aside for a moment Even though maybe you showed up looking for something else, Jesus wants to take you aside for a moment. And these friends, they begged Jesus to touch this young man, but that Greek word for touch is not a light touch. It actually means to hold on to, to cling to. So these friends were not asking Jesus for a one-time miracle for their friend. 
They were asking Jesus to hold on to their friends so tightly, to cling to him. And maybe you came to church this morning hoping just for a light touch, just a quick pass before you start your week, before you move on your way. But I think that God is here because he wants to hold on to you. He wants to bring you close. And he just says, if you will love me with all of your heart, I will never let you go. I began a good work in you. I will be faithful to complete it. I will give you desires. I will give you promises. I will give you hopes. So if you're here this morning and you just need that touch, you need that touch that is that tight, tight grasp, that holding on, maybe you feel like you've been distant or far. Like we sang earlier, you just wanna feel that God is so close to you, that he sees you, that he knows you, that he cares for you. If you're here this morning and that's you, if you would just raise your hand, put it up, and then you can put it back down. I just wanna pray with you right now. I see you. I see you, amen. So if you're here and that's you, I just want you to imagine God being close to you in this moment. That he's holding you so tightly. God, for every person sitting here, God, who just needs to know that they are worthy of love. God, that needs to know that you are here with them and for them. I just ask that your presence would be so thick, so tangible, so palpable, God, that they could feel you in this moment. God, that even as we continue to sing and continue to worship, that your presence would just get stronger and heavier over them, that it would be just like a blanket or a cloud that just covers them, that covers them with grace, that covers them with love, that covers them with healing and compassion that you would be the God of their heart this morning. And maybe you're here and you feel stuck in the middle of the process. Maybe you know that God has started something with you and you just feel like half of it, really? Why couldn't we have just done it all at once? Like we're still doing this, still here together, still in this process. And if that's you and you just feel stuck in the middle, if you would just raise your hand up and then put it back down. I see you. God, you have never left us. You have never forsaken us. For every person who feels stuck, God, I ask that your, your spirit would just come and be like that rushing wind that pushes them, that gives them this renewed sense of momentum and vision. God, for every person who feels like they're seeing just a blurry picture, God, trees and like people or people like trees, they can't even make sense of what they're seeing. God, you said that now we see only in part, but one day we will see clearly. And God, I don't even ask for clarity. I just ask for patience in the process. God, I know that you are working in each of us in these moments and, and we don't wanna rush a process. We don't wanna skip steps. We wanna sit in it and trust you. And I just ask for a renewed sense of faithfulness for every person here who just needs to know that you are in that process with them and that it's not for vain, that you will always be true to your promises. And lastly, if you're here and maybe a friend brought you to church or maybe you're joining us on the live stream and you don't even know why you're watching this, but as I've been talking, you just feel that pull, like God's just pulling you to him. If you're here and you've never said yes to following Jesus, Maybe you're hearing these stories and you're like, what, is, what does this even mean for my life? Do this and I will live. What is that life that God invites us into? If you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus, 
I would love to pray with you. If that's you, if you would just shoot your hand up really quick, you could put it right back down. If you hear the sound of my voice, you just say, I wanna follow Jesus. I don't even know maybe all of what that means, but I know that I wanna follow him. And just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I wanna give you my whole heart. God, I choose to follow you with my life. God, thank you for dying for me so that I might live. In Jesus' name. If you guys would stand up with me, we're gonna step into a time of communion. Now communion is this beautiful symbolic act. It says that on the, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was sitting with some of his closest friends. And as they were sitting there all together, Jesus knew that that was the last time in this life, in this body as it was, that he was going to be with them. And so they partook in this beautiful act that we call communion. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, Paul is recounting what happened that night. He says, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So communion is a time for us as a church to gather together to remember all of the things that God has done for us. Sometimes when my heart likes to forget that God is faithful, that God is true to his promises, I have to remember back to other times. I have to remember back to other times when God was faithful and other times when God brought people into my life at just the right moment when I needed him. Other times when God met me and I think going into this season that could have been so confusing for them. This is their savior and he's about to die. He had promised to raise three days later, but they're halfway through the story and they're not yet going to see the fulfillment of that promise. He said, hey, when you get together, when you eat this bread and when you drink this cup, remember me, remember the things that I told you. And I love in the, the story of this miracle that this guy had some friends who knew who Jesus was and brought their friend to him. And when we take communion, Jesus took it with his friends. Because sometimes I have a horrible memory and I'm gonna forget and I'm gonna need you to remind me. Hey, Shalise, remember when God did that? Remember that time? So what I would love to do today, we're gonna take communion together and our elders are gonna be serving us communion. And what I would love to do is to invite you to come and partake in communion, but I would love for you to do it with a friend. It could be somebody you came to church with. It could be a neighbor next to you. But I would love for you to take communion together. And so you're gonna come up and you're gonna take the cracker and you're gonna dip it into the cup. And then I want you to take it back to your seat and get together with some friends and maybe just say a short prayer of remembrance, thanking God for the ways that he's shown up in your life, thanking God for who he is. And we're gonna spend some time and the band is gonna play and we're gonna do this together. And then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna pray and we're gonna end with some more worship. If you're in the back half of the room, we have elders on either side about halfway up and you can come forward. Everybody who is in front, you can come forward to our elders up here on the sides. So God, as we take communion in remembrance of you, I ask for a supernatural recall right now. 
that you would just be speaking to each person moments that you showed up for them, moments that you were true to your promises, moments, God, when you were so close and holding us so tight. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You are listening to the Makers Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org.